I'm Jeff Irvine. I'm the creator and founder of Bridget. Um, before we get started tonight, a young man who I met uh, a few months back, Wilf Pashan, who's here tonight, um, I met him and he, he does wonderful things in the areas of spoken word and he started working with us also on some other projects that we're doing with Miami Heat and I asked him to be here tonight to kind of open up with a spoken word that we've been working on as it relates to really kindness, bullying, coming together as a community. So with that, I'll turn it over to Will. How's everybody doing? All right, all right. My name is uh, Will Fonsham, um, and I'm really, really blessed to be here tonight. So good to see some familiar faces. Um, and I want to say before I start with this piece um, that I have lived through our public school system and the challenges that be it inside of it. Um, kindness, kindness is such a virtue that can be taken for granted these days. And, and um, that's what this piece is on. This piece is called Pump Up the Kindness. All right, so if you know anything about spoken word, if you hear something that you like, go ahead and give a little snap as the piece is going on. All right, so that's just a little rule of thumb. All right, hope you enjoy it. We are born wanting, born curious, born kind. Love comes naturally as an infant. It's genuine, pure, stable, able to hold weight and sail through storms. That's called a relationship that's priceless. And alongside it are lifeboats, all inflated with kindness. Love, it's like the life of the party giving you joy, something to laugh about. But don't relationships sink as soon as the love runs out? When it runs, people change, especially when love is provoked. Then they just act like they're OK, when their true heart is hidden and cloaked. And imagine you causing the storm in someone else's life whether it's face to face or with that keyboard you use to type or that pencil you use to write or social media where you could spite. See, there isn't one season where bullying can bring some light. Life itself already has problems. Don't create the waves to toss and turn someone into depression. Then you create a grave six feet deep. That's the lowest point for a human being. Unless you are a human seeing yourself as a bridge kindly lifting your brother up on a high note. Because although that ship sank, remember, you still have that lifeboat, fully inflated, attached to the core of your soul. Because your kindness can save another while it makes your heart whole. Hurt people hurt people. But heal people fix incisions. Then, then love, love returns, returns back. back. More than a visit. Extend your arm and your voice. That's all it takes to bridge it. Now we can all fix any boats that may not have hope, living lifeless. So when you see anyone deflated, you know how to pump up the kindness. I'm next going to introduce uh, one of my colleagues and really uh, one of my mentors in education, uh, Dr. Michael Gillespie. Uh, Michael and I have been working together for the last four years uh, on this project called Bridget. And uh, it's, it's got a lot of seasoning for Michael and a lot of other great people in, uh, in areas. So uh, we're fortunate to have him here today. Good evening, everybody. I'm the one who's fortunate to have had a chance to work with this gentleman. In order for us to get started with what we need to talk about in terms of what he endured and what he has done, despite what he had to endure, He'll tell you all about it. I wanted to ask you a question. But first, I've got to say something that I'm quoting from Robert Frost. It's called The Secret. We dance around in a circle and suppose. But the secret sits in the middle and knows. I'll say it again, because it took me a moment to really grasp what the poet was saying. We dance around in a circle and suppose, but the secret sits in the middle and knows. I'd like you just to turn to whoever's closest to you and tell me what the secret is that's sitting in the middle. Discuss with another person and tell all of us what the secret is.
All right, does everyone have something that he or she can say if called upon? I really should tell you that I worked as a, well, I was a teacher, but I was an administrator for a lot of the years. But I was a teacher for 43 years. And whenever I was stumped because my class was really not participating in the ways that I wanted them to, I would spring this on them. And then they would respond. I could always get their attention with this, these two or three lines by Robert Frost. So what do you say? What's the secret? I have to call on somebody? <laughs> <laughs> What's the secret? Yes. The truth. The truth. What else? Love. Pardon? Love. Love. Interesting. This young lady was very involved in talking <laughs> to someone. What did you think? Um, um. You don't know? Yes, you do. You just don't want to say it. <laughs> <laughs> Your happiness is always like right there. And you just have to be grateful for what you have. You don't have to go around circles, searching around. It's always there. Be appreciative for what you have. A in poetry. <laughs> but it's more than that. It's more than that. What is it not? What is not the secret? I'll give you a hint. Greed. Anything else? Judgmental. Judgment. Separation. Separation. Pride. Pride. Trauma. Trauma or drama? Both. 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 <laughs> exactly. Well, of course, I'm not going to tell you what the secret is. But Jeff, as he speaks this evening, is going to get closer and closer and closer to the definition. And at the end, I'll come back, and then I'll ask you what the secret is. Because you can't really talk about anybody's life, certainly not Jeff's, which is very different from the life that I have led. You can't speak about anybody's life without understanding that the secret sits in the middle. The secret is in the middle. And it's up to you to find the secret and to use it to your advantage, but not only to your advantage, but to the advantage of others. And so with that, I turn this over to my boss and my friend, and I guess my business partner, <laughs> Jeffrey Irvine. Boss was not the right descriptor, so um, there's so much more to it. So by way of introduction, I'm Jeff Irvine. And for those of you who didn't go online and read a little bit about me, um, I'm 53 years old. And uh, I'm a father of two children who are 19 and 22. I've been married for 29 years. Um, when I was growing up, I grew up in a homogeneous white community in Westchester, Pennsylvania, and had an idyllic lifestyle, was publicly educated, and my father always told me, you have one reputation, and nobody can take it away from you. Never compromise your reputation. And that, I really believe that. And my parents didn't go to college, so we we're the first generation, of my brothers and sisters, to go to college. I worked very hard for a lot of years. I became a CPA. I got my MBA in finance out of Columbia. I went to Wall Street. I was an investment banker. I did hundreds of millions of dollars of deals. I went on to run trading firms and hedge funds in the late, from 2000 and 1998 pretty much through 2006. And the largest of hedge fund that I ran had $7 billion of position. And we traded every market around the world every day. And essentially, I became a risk manager, looking at the behavior of the market, right? Increase your winners, right? Cut your losers. Maximize the return for your pension funds, your municipal workers, for your clients. That was the goal. And do it across a number of different markets, right? The equity markets, the debt markets, the options markets. And so every day, I was looking at the market, which is, a, is really what drives the market is behavior. What we think is going to happen, how we feel, how safe we feel. 
When we don't feel safe, what do we do? We pull out of the market. We did that in 08. What happened? The market crashed. When things are going well, what do we do? We load up on the market, and so does everyone else. And what happens? The market comes up together, and all boats rise. So the market is just a reflection of the community and how it feels. And that's important uh, as I tell the rest of the story tonight. So as a Boy Scout as well, not an Eagle Scout, a Life Scout, um, and I just lived by a very Catholic code, if you will, and um, always believed in doing the right thing and be caring and be kind, right? Be kind. And uh, in 2006, I was introduced to a very bad person who had taken a lot of money from a lot of people that I knew, did not know he was a bad person, and his family were bad people. Introduced by very reputable people all around me. You have to go help this family, build this office, so on and so forth. I did my due diligence. I figured out they were running a Ponzi scheme. Now, this is two and a half years before Madoff hit the press. So what did I do? Well, being the Boy Scout and the way I was raised, I turned that person over to the FBI. That person then went to jail about a year or so later, going through the legal processes. Two and a half years later, that person got out of jail got deported out of the U.S. back to their home country of Turkey, as it happened to be, put up a website, and destroyed my reputation. Such that if you Googled me from 2008 through 2012, at the top of my Google search, it said Con v. Con. You clicked on it, it went to a picture of my wife and I. I think I was in a tux and she was in a red dress, you know, something they'd found on the internet. And then you clicked again on that picture and it went to his level two Google site, which had 180 backlinks, which made it very strong back in, that, in those days. Meaning no matter what I did, I could not push down what he was saying on his website. And on his website, he said I was a convict and a con artist just like he was. I was on Wall Street. People trusted me. We ran billions of dollars. My whole livelihood, my whole identity was built on trust. Then Madoff comes along, right? Madoff had happened in the interim. So what had happened was anything, anything that was written online that said you were associated with a Ponzi scheme or that you might be corrupt, you became guilty. I could not raise any money after that point. I couldn't face people after that point. I withdrew because my whole identity was now that I was in league with this guy who ran in a, a Ponzi scheme in a post Madoff world. My name was Mud. I lost everything. I lost my identity at the age of 42. So what do you do? What would you do? Right? What are the recourse mechanisms? How, how do you remediate this? How do you get back to where you were? You worked your whole life under a construct that said if you work hard and you're honest and you do well by everyone around you, you will be rewarded, right? And that construct no longer exists. So what did I do? Fortunately, I didn't give up. I went to court. I spent four and a half years in court uh, trying to win a defamation per se case against the person because I needed that lawsuit victory to sh show Google so that they would take it down. Along the way, I became an expert in defamation per se, civil and tort the world over. There's about 125 countries where it exists. Um, I became an expert on online privacy as it relates to COPA, FERPA, HIPAA, SIPA, Patriot Act, everything about protecting you online, your identity online which we don't do too good a job at because it's very hard. And then finally, I became an expert in social emotional learning. How do we connect? I know what you know, what I know. How do we relate? How do you see me? How do I see you? And that is the fundamental of all these restorative practices and all these terms that you'll hear as you go through the schools around social emotional learning and so on and so forth. How do I relate to you? Where are we alike? Fortunately, I had the time and money to go to court, spent a lot of money, a lot of time uh, fighting, and I won a verdict of defamation per se for several million dollars, which I would never collect. But I, in winning that victory, I got to sue Google, or threatened to sue Google, and then they backed off, and they took it down. 
But when they took it down, they didn't just take it down. And when I say take it down, remove all that information from their search algorithms, because that's what taking it down is. If you can't search for it, it doesn't exist in that environment that we call the internet. So I got it all taken down. It, it, was, it was very, very good. Um, but they, for in the next six months, they put a little asterisk up. And they said, something's been removed from this search. So when you searched me for the six months afterward, right, I spent five years to work this down. And then they left this little asterisk saying, something's been removed from this search. So that, what does that make people think? What was removed? So you perpetuate the identity threat and continue what's going on. So what I learned, and I started off by saying I grew up in a homogeneous white community, I'm male, I got well educated, so the world was my oyster in the US, right? I never thought that I would become an extreme minority. I never thought that I would suffer identity threat in the way I did. And until you feel that pain, and it is pain, right? Because every day you wake up and you think about it. And it wasn't about me thinking about it as it related to me, but how did it affect my wife? How did it affect my kids, right? It was the people around me that I was really concerned with. So after winning, getting it all down, I'm like, well, what do I do next? My world had changed. Being on Wall Street wasn't important to me anymore. Making money wasn't important. Along the way, I met all these great professors in the areas of social emotional learning. But more importantly, and the reason why I'm up here today, is I met all these parents who were dealing with, and these students who were dealing with the aftermath of identity threat online. Students had been pulled from school permanently because there had been something that had happened. Uh, students who were cutting, students who were going through suicide ideation, parents who had lost their children. As I was trying to figure out how do I attack this problem, I was listening to everyone else who was dealing with the same problem. And I realized that I'm a 42-year-old guy, 50-year-old guy, I've been okay, but these kids don't stand a chance, right? And so it made me rethink socialization in the 21st century. Because the power of Zuckerberg and the power of Google now shape your environment, shape everything you do, whether you know it or not. They map your behavior every day. So I said, how do we stop this? So I started going to the schools. I read every research study from around the world on bullying and harassment that was out there, probably about 300 that I had read, there were probably 1,000. The problem is the same everywhere, in every country. And the results are the same too. We're losing the battle, we're losing the ground. Someone asked me earlier, how many students take their lives every year? It's around five, 6,000 right now between the ages of 10 and 24 in the US. That's recorded. And that's been growing at a 10% rate every year for students between the ages of 14 and 24. It's been growing at a 20% rate for students between the ages of, of 10 and 14. These are really scary numbers. And as you start to look at the research that's out there and the data, it says that we're not happy. It says that we have a lot more anxiety. And when I say us, I mean everyone, but the students as well. We feel less connected. We feel lonely. So what do we do? What should we be doing? It's hard. This is a hard problem that we all face today. And, and so how do, you, how do you start to change that? So that's why I partner with Dr. Gillespie, Dr. Lipson on the West Coast, a myriad of other uh, groups at NYU, Columbia, to really say, OK, we can measure it all. We can see it after the fact. But how do we get ahead of it, right? As I read Columbine, Parkland, Santa Fe, Sandy Hook, all these reports on the mass shootings and what went on, the conclusion was the same for every one of them. The only way to prevent and change is by changing the culture. The only way to change culture effectively that we have today is social emotional learning curriculums. And what does that mean? Lessons, talking, connecting about how we feel about this, that, and the other thing, how we feel in relation to one another, making it very simple. So problem is we don't have time, money, or budget for that in any of the schools, especially in the public schools. 
to allow that curriculum to be there. Historically, we called it character education, and it was one of the two fundamental principles in public education in the US since the mid-1800s. Teach them to be smart, teach them to be good. In the 1950s, we started to leave the be good aside. Oh, we'll do that at home. Then the family life has fallen apart. And now we're even more disconnected today. So how do we bring back teaching to be good into the academic community, right? And why do we need to bring it to the academic community? Because young people today, where do you have the most eye contact? Where do you have the most connection with students around you? Probably in school, right? As you go class to class, as you walk down the hallway. You're forced to make eye contact all the time. And so when that happens, there's all these chemical releases that go off on your brain, and you're trying to read each other. Is it about a happy eyes or those sad eyes, right? And as we do, and as we connect and we have someone, if I smile at you and we start to talk and everything, you'll smile back, and the dopamine will start to flow. And you'll feel good, and you'll feel more connected, right? So we have to. But if you have one of these, and I'm looking into this, can someone tell me where the eyes are that I'm connecting with here? Right? We're not. And it's not healthy. Because there's two things as human beings that we need that are hard-coded into our amygdala. And our amygdala is the base part of our brain that's been around for 50,000 years. And it says, got to be safe, right? Got to be connected. Every one of us wants to feel safe, no matter where we are. And every one of us wants to be connected in a community. It can be, a community can be two people. It can be 10 people. And we need that. We need that to feel good, right? And if we don't have that, we don't feel good. And then the loneliness comes, and the anxiety, and the depression. And those rates of depression right now in the US are, in the latest survey show, grades 6 through 12 is around 3.1 million students out of 25 million. So that's around 9%. And it's growing. And the amount of medication is growing. So I looked at this problem like, this is a gigantic problem. Where do we start? We start with a community. What's our strongest community? Our school community. It's where you have the most social interaction, right, every day. Once you go home, what do you do? You get on your phone, you have your chat groups, you do your homework, right? But those five, six hours, those six, seven periods where you're in a group, you're connected as much as you are throughout the rest of the day. So we wanted to go into schools and give tools to the students so that they can better connect. When you guys were all growing up, how did you learn to socialize? I'll talk to the grown-ups in the room. Did we model the behavior of our parents? And why did we do that? ingrained, but why did we want to model? We wanted to be accepted by our parents. We established boundaries, right? Smile, let one person talk, let the other person talk, greet with a handshake, make positive eye contact. That's how we learn to socialize. And it's always been done through modeling. And in the schools, the teachers model as well, right? They're always modeling. They call Mr. Miss, this, that, showing respect. So the internet comes along. Mr. Jobs comes along in 2007. And he brings out this piece of glass again, right? So I'll ask the adults in the room first. Who did you model to use your phone? How did you develop the routines and rewards to develop the positive habits of communication that you use every day? And the answer is none of us did. We gave the most powerful communication device ever to each other, and we didn't think about how do I use it on a social level? And yet we call it social media, but it's really a misnomer, isn't it? As it divides us, as it's used to pro propel hate, as it's used to allow revenge to happen very easily. So genie's out of the bottle, right? It's not going back in. No one's given up their Google search. No one's given up their cell phones. So what have you mastered what do you think you've really mastered so far in life? In life. In life. In general. What's, the, what's tool have you mastered? Um, say in life, thinking. Anything. 
communication tools. What, what, are you what, are you, what are you comfortable with? Speaking. What about the phone? Have you mastered the phone? Do you think all your other friends and students have mastered the phone? Yes. When do you think you mastered that phone? What grade? When? Um, when did you get your phone? I'm gonna, I'm, I hope you don't mind. Sixth grade. Sixth grade, got the phone. How long did it take you to master it? Not that long. Not that long being a week, a month? Maybe a month. Maybe a month. So, if life is about autonomy, mastery, and purpose to be happy, right? Let's just take that as a given from a psychological perspective. You have full autonomy with your phone, right? No one else has it. It's all yours. No one else sees it. So you're pow you got power there, right? And you've mastered it. So what's the purpose of the phone? What's the purpose of the phone? Communicate what? How about, how about this? Communicate how. We live in a world of how. How we do things Direct matters. Without taking time to add nice kisses. That's how we do it, right? Okay. Still about kisses. We have kisses and emojis. That is correct. <laughs> I will give you that. But where are the eyes? We can't get away from the communication. We cannot get away from it. So if this tool you've mastered, right, and it only took you a month, it took me a long, long time. I don't know about other people in the room, but it took me a very long time to do it. What if it said default to positive? Think about that. What if the default first move communication is always positive, right? Because right now we don't default to positive, do we? We react in any which way we can, right? Sometimes it's positive, sometimes it's fun, sometimes it's negative. How does the general news media react to us and how do they manipulate us? Is it to be positive and kind or is it to be divisive and comparative and to choose? So what my team and I did, thank, thank goodness I have a team, was say we're in this reactive world, all of us, right? And even with bullying, which is the most overused term in the world today, right? They've even adopted it in countries where they never used the term before in Latin America and South America um, because it's easy to say, oh, I've been bullied. How about just conflict? We have conflict all the time now, right? And we have drama all the time. So how do we use this tool that you've mastered? Can we use this tool you mastered to be proactive and positive? Can we use this tool to change culture, to make us feel more connected versus less connected. And that's the problem and, and the approach that we've taken uh, in terms of, in order for us to stop the suicides, the suicide ideation, the overall levels of depression, loneliness that you will continue to read about. And we're hearing a lot about kindness today, which is great, but how do we do it? Because it's how. How do we implement it? How do we measure kindness? How do we know if we're getting better or worse if we can't measure it? You have the most complicated problem in the world, which is measuring the social temperature or barometer of a community. You know? And some schools I, we walk into, wow, you can see it. You can feel the positivity. You can feel the confidence. Other schools we walk into, kids are scared. They're really scared. And funny the correlation between academics and fear and no fear. Very direct documented. So how do we make the students feel safe? How do we make them feel connected? How do we make them feel like they belong, feel loved, and feel as though they can be vulnerable? Because to truly learn, you have to take a risk, right? And these are the things. Against the backdrop of, I'm sure everyone's worried about their online image, right? How they're perceived, what's said about them. And it's constant. The average High school students send somewhere between three and 5,000 texts. They stop measuring it. You know, five years ago, it was 3,500 texts a month. Now it's got to be 5,000. So how do we take that flow of communication and have it default to positive? How do we measure that? So that's what we've done at Bridget. And what we've done is create your own social safety network, your own closed network where the principal 
is Mark Zuckerberg. And the principal is defining the culture through their leadership message. It may be trust, right? You may be support. It may be kindness. And what are all those things? What is trust? What is support? What, are, what do we call those? They're values, right? They're fundamental values. Constitutions built on values, not laws, right? Values form communities. And so it all comes together in this way. So we created a system that allows students to come in every day and recognize some other student for being great at academics, for being a great friend, for being great at the arts. And we do that in a way that attaches to their mentalizing system, not their cerebral cortex. And the mentalizing system is a memory system that we have that's based on feelings and connectedness. And it's very long term. Because if you think about the greatest thing that happened to you when you were younger, it was some emotional event. You met your spouse. You went to a great party, whatever it is. And if you think about the worst things, where you feel shame, you feel regret, those are very strong ideas that never leave us stay with us our entire lives, right? Unfortunately, today, there's too much negativity. There's too many of those negative threats that our students are facing. And then the ripple effects into the home is we all end up facing it together. So it's not, could we do this? It's, should we do this? We really have to do this if we want to start to win the battles, if we want to turn the tide in what we're doing. It's got to be simple. It's got to be easy. So in our schools, and I'll give you an example of one of our schools in uh, Orangebrook uh, Elementary. And we're in middle high schools and as well as elementary. And I never thought we'd be in elementary. But the students come in every day. They sit in circles. They open up their computers. And they give shout outs to each other. And a shout out is just a digital affirmation of, hey, just because, you're a great friend. And in that, there's a preset and positive phrase. There's an icon. Right? A symbol that's there. And all these things resonate in the brain. And then there's a GIF, because there's got to be a GIF, right? Why do we like GIFs? Because everyone, as I say, GIF starts to smile. And then you think about the really funny ones, and you start to chuckle, right? Well, laughter is the most powerful social tool that binds people that anyone can have. If you could be la start your day in school laughing every day, you're not going to have any problems. And the problems you do have, you'll distance yourself from. Because most of our students have some problems. And too many of our students have really bad problems. So we need to change the culture. So in this school of 600 elementary school students that can't come in, for 10 minutes they give each other shout outs. And as they give the shout outs, they get basically a digital baseball card of who they gave it to, what they give it to them for, and how many, and they get points for giving it. Now we've taken the idea of PBIS, which you may or may not know what that is, uh, but the idea is about having teachers affirm students for doing good, and we've turned it on its head and we have students recognizing students. And we know that peer-to-peer -peer affirmation works. So in this school, they've been doing it for two months at the end of last year, three months so far this year. Those 600 students have given over 40,000 shout outs to one another. And if I gave any one of you a shout out every day for the next 20 days, we don't know each other at all. But we will know each other more. We will have things in common, right? And they'll be positive. So if we have positive things in common, it makes you feel good, right? But it also it acts as a deterrent from us having a conflict, right? So. At the end of the day, character education, social emotional learning is about making friends. You need to be able to make friends. You'll hear it as healthy relationships, yada, yada, yada. You'll find all this terminology. But we need to be able to make friends and maintain friends. If we practice every day being positive, and you have a, a student body of 1,000 students, and they each have to give a shout out to someone else and give themselves a win for something they did well every day, and there's 180 school days, it's 180,000 positive opportunities to interact, right? But it's driven by the students, right? In the high schools, we let the students drive what's going on. And then if we gamify it, right, and have competitions, group competitions around 
positivity, affirmation, so on and so forth. Now it, it further becomes driving the school culture, but it's run by the students at the high school level. So we've done this, and we've done it for the last five years. And we're just now getting to the point where we have enough data to say, kids feel safe, kids are doing better academically. And it's driven by kids. It's driven by our students. Because we will fail as adults if we try to solve their social problems. We have to give them the tools so that they can solve their own problems. I'm not giving a demonstration tonight of the system. I really wanted to kind of do this introduction and then really open it up to questions about me, about the concepts, the challenges that you guys face. And, you know, we know what goes on in the schools. We talk to the students every day. We WebEx with them around the country. Same problems, different communities. Doesn't matter. Socioeconomics doesn't matter. Race doesn't matter. Ethnicity doesn't matter. Country doesn't matter. All the students have the same problems. And the problems, when I say problems, same fears, right? And it's the social fear related to that community. So, yes, sir. Jeff, do you, uh, do you feel that just reaching out to the students is valuable enough or something we, that we've learned in Liberty City is we also have to reach out to the parents because the parents and how they deal with the, the students when they come home are the enforcers of the things that we're trying to teach the kids. So if we talk to the kids about staying in school longer and doing their homework and things of that nature, and they go home and the second they get home, the parents are saying, you don't have time to do your homework, you need to babysit, I need to go out, or you need to go to McDonald's and earn five bucks an hour and come home. So it's for us, what we've learned over there is we've also got to incorporate the parents in anything we try to teach our students. The research shows you're exactly correct. Aligning the parent and the teacher and the character education of the student, how to make friends, how to get along, right? There has to be that connection. Parents have to support teachers, and teachers have to be feel supported or else they'll be like, oh, these parents are terrible, right? Everyone looks to blame first. but everyone has the same interest in the student at the end of the day. So it's not about the parents. It's about the parents and the teachers focusing on the needs of the student. And that's the hard part of today, is to get us out of that mindset that it's about us. It's not about us. It's about the future, and the future is not us. The future is sitting next to us. And you know, we deal with the kids with the phone calls and you know, all the negative chats and all of that. What are the three things that we need well, there's lots of things we need to do, and every situation is different, obviously, but you have to talk to your kids, and it's harder to talk to your kids today, right? But as you talk to them, you also have to listen to them and understand, you know, why they want the, what they're doing with the phone and what they're trying to achieve. Yes? The the limit, or, or how would be the arrangement for a home? Like if I would give, I don't have, my kids are young now, but if I want to give my child a phone that I'm paying, I'm going to say, this is not your phone, it's actually my phone, and it's a house phone, and I'm going to be looking. Will you have how do you do, like, how do you manage that privacy part? Because I'm sure that there has to, the child must have some privacy, but also you, this is a tool that you can kind of see how he's socializing. Right, right. We used to be able to see socialization because it was right in front of us. And now we don't see it because we don't see where you guys are. And, and we want to know because we know you're safe. So opening up the lines of communication with your child on a regular basis and talking about it is more powerful than tracking them online because they'll figure out a way around it so you can't track them. So that's a futile attempt of, with natural language processing and everything else. We've looked at it all. It doesn't work. You have to engage with your kids. But you also have to set boundaries around the phones, right? You're going out to dinner, whether it's McDonald's or Shea this or Shea that, phones stay at home. You have to drive eye-to-eye -eye contact and communication. You have to say, phones go off at this hour of night, right? You have to put the boundaries where you can. And guess what? At the end of the day, it's actually a relief for your children to know that phone's off and they don't have access to it. 
just as it's a relief. How many of you turn your phones off every night? Not a lot, right? You're in the extreme minority. Next question about how do you get parents involved to be positive and each school and each neighborhood is individual. So you've got different dynamics. And so what has the experience been for you and the schools that are in to it, it, it's a great question, because what works, right? How do we make a school better, or a community better? How do we enhance the positivity? And we found it takes two things. A great leader, which is your principal, who's empowered and committed to the safety of the students and their social emotional wellness. If a principal isn't committed to that, they really shouldn't be in that position. Empowering that leader, because they all have a vision, you have to ask them what that vision is. You know, what are the, aside from hitting the academic rigors that they're now forced to, or else they have a punitive problem going on in terms of their own performance, what do they want to do socially and emotionally for their kids? And secondarily, the question is, how are the students empowered? You need to empower the students to set their own culture. You need to allow them to run projects and engagement to help build that. And, but the leadership, that principle has to inspire that to happen. And it doesn't have to be the whole school all at once. There are groups that want the things to be safe. We know all you students want to feel safe. You want to feel safe online, right? Because it's when you don't feel safe that you think about that. So having the great leader, the principal, who's a great communicator, consistently put a message of safety out there and connectedness. And the students listening to that and hearing that and being able to make that happen. That's what needs to happen, really at the high school level. At the elementary school level, it's a much more guided uh, conversation in terms of what's going on. Um, what we're seeing across the country is the infusion of social emotional learning lessons, which I'm sure students are seeing more and more of that. You'll see circle treatments where we're talking uh, in circles and talking about different issues that are affecting people. So it's starting to come on. It's very, very slow. It's very, very hard to do because it takes time. And we have to make the time. So it's a combination of leadership and the leadership directing the student body to protect themselves in the sense of come together and be more connected. I know that we figured out how to do all this in stages. <laughs> but one of the uh, predicates program that you came to us with originally was it was kind of all inclusive to try to deal with some of these bullying and other kinds of difficulties in the schools or wherever it was so that a given problem with a given student in a given place could be addressed by as it were the students, teachers, administrators, parents, and anybody else that had to muck in with it, uh, kind of the same kind of set of understandings and resources. So that you were not going around and everybody running out with a different idea. You had a, uh, set, of, a set of responses, as it were, but ultimately, and that included the shout outs that, that led to you know, how, how could you get a, everybody on the same page? So we created a resource center. It's like Netflix for social emotional learning and safety, right? It's tagged by age and grade, so everything's rated as well. It's about having the right conversation for the right problem in that moment. And we found that we could create this platform, and we added about 3,500 items in there, as well as the locals, local items. And what it does is it allows any two teacher, student, or parent to have tools, a video, a conversation starter, around a particular type of problem, right? So if there's a problem about someone using uh, a racist word, there's, there's videos on what you said was racist versus being racist, right? If you're having a problem with being sorry and showing remorse, there's videos on showing remorse and conversations that can be had there. And it goes into why and how, 
because it's about why and how. Um, so we've been able to put this all together. We're going to ask you to do a little demo. You are? Yes, we are. OK. So what we've created is basically this is your own social network for the school. So it's not connected to anyone outside. Um, it has the ability to do reports, which we turn on or off depending on the age level. It has a positivity engine. It has a messaging engine, so you can constantly be pushing out ideas and constantly reminding uh, students to be kind and connected. And it has a resource center. I want to show you how we give a shout out so you'll understand what I was talking about a little better. So we'll click Pulse. And everything here is on your phone as well in the native app, but I'll show you here. Everyone has a scorecard around positivity. So shout outs received, shout outs given, wins received, total points. You get points for giving. You get a maximum of three points a day for three shout outs. Very simple. Uh, if you give a shout out to someone who's in the lowest 10% of receiving, you get additional points, but you don't know who that is. But the students know who the most disconnected students are, right? And so you'll know how to get those extra points. And that person receiving those extra shout outs who's most disconnected, how are they going to feel? They're going to feel more connected. They're going to feel better about themselves and their relationship with the school. So to give a shout out, it's got to be easy and fast. We do this in first grade through 12th grade. Send a shout out, hit continue. What am I going to recognize you for? Maybe you're great at academics, maybe visual arts, athletics, performing arts, student leadership, community service, friendship, just because. Our students came back and said, we want happy birthday. We want get well. We want I'm sorry and I forgive you. Congratulations and thank you, the most powerful. And when we surveyed the students, they said, we said, which ones are most important to you? And which two do you think the middle school students were mo thought were most important? Anyone? I'm sorry, and I forgive you. And it's a testament, and we're in such a short period since we launched all this media, social media, but it's a testament to how we behave and how we engage. If I can say I'm sorry digitally to you first, it makes it easier for me to come back in and face you and face your eyes, right? And so this acts as a first step. We're always trying to get to a conversation and, and the ability to, to be engaged. So I'll just say thank you. Hit continue. You saw that we use symbols because symbols are lasting in our brains, right? And they're things that hang with us for years and years and years. So a thank you symbol is there. Um, the this, this system is pre-populated, so everyone's name is here. I think Julia Roberts is in here in this demo environment. So I can give a shout out to Julia, or I can give a shout out to a number of people. And then I can say the message is thanks, thank you, all preset and positive. Can't write anything. We want to practice, practice, practice. Because Einstein said, and a lot of other people have said, how do you change behavior? And that's what we're trying to do, right? You only do it by practicing it over and over again. And so that is why that is there. We can grab a GIF. We have hundreds and thousands of them. They're all s sorted by us and, and tagged by us. There's nothing untoward. There's nothing salation. There's nothing mean in there. So they're all preset. They're all positive. We now have the students making GIFs that are just positive and are based in fundamental values. And they love it. And so think about that. You have students creating something that is permanent in nature and positive. How often do we get to say that, right? And so then it comes into our system, and they can use it, and students from around the country and around the world can use it. We want to set a backfire of positivity using the tool that you've mastered from, the, from third grade on, right? And let's, let's let lead with that positivity. So um, uh, let's grab anything here. Grab the panda because it's fun. And I hit send. And it just goes to that person. It's not broadcast. It's not comparative in nature. The reason we're all depressed or anxiety driven is because everything we're seeing is in real time. And when we look at things in real time, we immediately have to make a judgment, am I better or worse? Because that's how we are. And when, as we decide in the moment whether we're better or worse, we use values that are short term in nature, not long term. So I sent it. It's there. I go to my shout outs. I look at my shout outs given. And then I ebbed up with this diary of positivity. 
and it's there, and I have it from grade to grade, right? And we ask the students, do they keep it? Guess what? They keep it, right? And they keep it from year to year. And as they matriculate out, they're now wanting us to move it into different environments so they can continue to keep it. So imagine if you had journals, and you still wrote in journals, and it was all about the positive things and positive engagements that you had. Would that be valuable to you? Students in the room, what do you think? Not sure. Yeah. Yes, maybe. It, it becomes a thing in the schools. It does become part of what's going on. Um, and then winds are the same thing. They're around South Praise. We use the teachers in middle and elementary school to guide the students to, hey, what did you do well this week? Give yourself a win, right? That self-reflective exercise is extremely powerful in your, in your social emotional growth and how you feel about yourself. Yes. No way. No. I was, we started out talking about privacy. Everything's got to be private. But if it's private and positive, we need privacy. What don't we have anymore? We don't have any privacy. We all live in glass houses. Everyone sees everything we do. The amount of privacy you have at this moment, right now, is the most amount of privacy that you're going to have for the rest of your lives. Think about that. Right now is as much privacy as you're ever going to have. And that's the world we live in. And that's a very scary world to live in. And that's why we're doing this. Right? What if Twitter and Facebook were only positive and only affirmative? How much better off would you be? How much drama would be gone? Wouldn't have happened. Right? We need to default to the positive. But how we do that is hard. But if you have tools to start to practice it, and you start to engage in the most engaged community you have on a face-to-face -face basis, which are your schools, that's where we have to start. And it has to be easy. And it has to be driven not by the adults in the room, but by the students. And guess what? The students take it on. Because if you start having shout-out contests, and in some of our schools they're having shout-out bombs. I'm like, what's a shout-out bomb? High school in, in Oregon. And I'm doing a WebEx. Oh, Jeff, we're going to call a shout-out bomb. Kids get on the speak PA system. They like, for the next five minutes, everyone in the school give a shout out to Ms. Jones and Home Hack. Right? That school, thousands of shout outs immediately hit Ms. Jones. How does Ms. Jones feel? How do you feel if you're giving the shout out to Ms. Jones? We've just aligned the entire community around positivity in one exercise that goes for five minutes. We have to be creative in how we use these tools, because these are tools. But we really have to listen to the students, because or guide the students, and they'll come up with creative ways to do it. And as we do that, guess what? Things start to get better faster. And that's what we're going for, and that's what we're documenting, and that's what the research we're doing as we go along is. And this is important. It's a should thing. It's something that we need to do. Oh, now we're back on the sand dunes at night. <laughs> Any questions about that? Oh, I want to show you one other thing, which is really cool. So after we do this, because I want to ask the students in the room, all two of you. So after all this positivity is going on, so what? Right? How do we bring it to life? How do we keep it going? How do we make it sustainable? Right? In a, in a world where we have no privacy, where all our decisions are made in the moment based on short-term values that are comparative in nature, how do we make it live on? How do we make it continue on? And that is the challenge. So I'll go to one of our schools. And this is a live school right now that I'm going to. What we do is we live stream it. So you'll walk into our schools, and you'll see all that positivity. So now you walk in, and you walk in, and you see a screen like this in the cafeteria. Or as you walk in, what do you immediately think? Well, you think Orange Book Elementary, shout outs by category. 710 in classwork. Lots of friendship, right? Lots of get well. 257 I'm sorry. It's 192. I forgive you, a thousand thank yous this year so far. What are we promoting? We're creating this positive social trigger. How many of you have gone to the heat game or a basketball game of any type or football game and done the wave? Right? We've all done it. How many of you have started the wave? Right? Well, what happens for that person who starts the wave? Everyone else follows, right? 
and you create this wave of positivity. Why do we do that? It's good for the team. It's good for what's in the middle. It aligns every around, around the same purpose, and we all feel more connected in that moment. So what if we could use these same shout outs and come up with different techniques to create multiple waves? Not every child feels happy in the moment, right? Not everyone's on every day. Some days you have big tests, other days you had a bad breakup, whatever it is. But if we always have a few of the students, or a few of the population, or a few of the leaders pushing out positivity and trying to create waves of positivity, now all of a sudden it comes on and becomes a part of your life. Now you can see maps, the most powerful thing in the world is a map, right? So now we can see how many shout outs happened at Orange Brook Elementary in the last six months. 40,000. Talk to that principal leader about what that has done to his school culture. It changed it because it made the student body more connected by default. There's no way that after 40,000 shout outs across 600 students and 60 teachers that you're not going to feel closer and more connected. There's no way. And that's what's amazing. And it's not just about the digital connection. We're connected now. We have those 20 shout outs between us. Do you guys know what streaks are? Anyone want to explain what a streak is? So, so a streak is usually in Snapchat when you send pictures for a certain amount of days. So like, like, like back and forth. So, so it keeps up with the, 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 the amount of days that you send. So, so if you don't send one day, then you lose the streak. So kids have streaks that go six, nine hundred days. But what, they, they borrow people's phones when they're on vacation and say, I gotta go my, keep my streak going. They log on. It's the addictive nature of the internet. And we looked at streaks and we talked to the students and we said, what if we took streaks and we changed it? And we said, we gotta have 20 back and forth and then you get 10 points, I get 10 points, the streak's over. And the only way I get more points is if I have more streaks. Well, the only way I'm gonna have more streaks is if I have more engagement with a variety of students. Now it forces us to cross-connect. And we'll build those this, this spring. Pretty cool, right? So now, what's the reward? You go to the Miami Heat game, right? Or you get a set of Bose headsets. Or you get a certificate of participation. Intrinsic, extrinsic, experiential. Now we're tying working together, we're tying connection back to a reward system. And therefore, we'll practice. But it won't be practice to us, it'll be Hey, we're having fun, we're competing. In Brooklyn, we're launching in 50 schools this year. The principals want to compete against one another. Okay, so now we've taken that leader and we've aligned them all around social emotional learning and connectedness. And what are they gonna do? They're gonna tell their students, hey, we gotta get this going. They're also gonna tell their teachers, hey, don't forget to have the students give a shout out. It only takes a few seconds. Now we're using the device that you've mastered, right? So that you can use it and do it when you want. You don't have to do it. You don't have to do it, but you want to. Any, Any questions? questions about that? Yes. yes. I just have a question whether you ever envision doing that in the Absolutely. Peer to peer recognition studies are out there. They work, they work in the office place. Our goal was to start in K to 12 because we're losing the next generation. They don't even know what they're losing or what they've lost. They don't know how we were raised. They don't know what privacy is. So we need to start there, right? Um, yeah, we've built the tools for communities, we've dealt it for all different topics, but we gotta stay focused. And right now we're saving lives in K-12, and I can point to it. Uh, we're having students come up to us and thank us because they feel safe. Because right now 61% of students across the US, according to Pew Research, think that there's gonna be a shooting in their school and 25% of those are really scared. And before I came down here this past week, after the shootings last week, and I was out in California speaking, I got calls from parents here. My kids won't go to school, right? And it's partially because social media is blowing it up, right? It's kind of like plane crashes versus car accidents. The number of people who have died in, in uh, plane crashes can fill Carnegie Hall, right, in the last 20 years. The number of people who have died in car accidents can fill Carnegie Hall call 150 times, right? We're getting the wrong messages out there in, in terms of what we're saying. We also have reporting tools. 
Reporting is a double-edged sword because of the way we set up the system. But I'm going to show you how we do that. We do it on a confidential basis for the principals who want to run this. Anonymous reporting does not work, so all the Florida apps and everything else will never really work because there's no accountability. There's zero accountability at the person receiving the report level. The other problem is snitches get stitches is still the overriding theme. There's too much risk uh, for many, many students, unless they feel safe, unless it's a part of the culture. So where it is a part of the culture, where safety, communicating when someone needs help is a part, we build a whole system that does that and then allows, so I'll go there. I click on reports. Let me make this a little bigger. And I can file a report for bullying, for fighting, for at-risk behavior, for sexual harassment, for emergency alerts. It's all modular. Santa Fe, they asked us to do things. California, they asked us to do things with sexual harassment. And so to file a report, I click on bullying. It's all icon-driven. This is in eight languages, so everyone can be included. When did it happen? It happened today. How was I involved? You'll see that we're using icons again. I was bullied, I participated, I saw it, someone showed me, someone told me. I'll say someone told me. Hit continue. Who was the target? You can say uh, Julia, McGrath, Julia Roberts was the target. Who was the aggressor? You don't have to say. The more important thing is you get support to the person who needs help, right? So I can say I don't know, or I can say it was Marshawn Lynch, uh, another teacher. And then were there witnesses in our schools asked they want witnesses because they want to create that accountability in the teachers who see it but just ignore it, right? They don't want to get involved. And that is par for the course, sadly, in, in many of the middle and high schools across the country. Is anyone at risk? If you say yes, it's not emergency alert, but it will elevate what's going on. I hit continue. How would you describe what happened? Was a physical, verbal, theft, vandalism, digital threat public, digital threat private, we need good data on this information. We need objective data, and we don't have it. And we need it in real time. So it was a fight after school because of a verbal altercation, all caused because someone snapped something online that someone captured and distributed to everyone in the world. Hit continue. Where did it happen? Online, on school property, in the cafeteria, in the schoolyard. Gathering the data so that you can now say, hey, how do we get ahead of this problem? And what was the result? What was the pain related to? Was it someone making fun of my weight? Or was it a Title IX issue about my race? Uh, was it about my appearance? Were they calling me stupid? All the things that we've always dealt with. But now, so much of it starts online. As we go around the country, 95% of the problems that the principals in this country face start online. And online is an environment that they're not responsible for. And yet, it comes into their school every day. So it's a catch-22. They want to get ahead of it but they oftentimes can't. You can write, you can attach snaps, you can attach uh, pics, you can write uh, cathartic response, I'm being bullied. Everyone agrees to the terms and conditions, and then you hit finish. And it immediately goes to those in charge who deal with the behavioral problems where kids become disconnected. Um, and immediately it pops up on their phone, and the report's created, and now they can investigate. And now they can assign what restorative practices are we going to use to help this student reconnect as fast as possible. Because time matters. And time's our most va valuable thing. If a problem doesn't get addressed early, it always morphs. And with social media, it morphs at life speed. And it becomes permanent in nature. And those are the things that we want to avoid. You can then notify the counselors. You can do follow-up steps right away. You can add notes. So these tools streamline the process of identifying a problem early and then applying the right restorative practice, the right resource. And you go to our resource center, which has thousands of resources. And the students have access to this as well. And the whole idea is that if they're too ashamed or they want to deal with it on their own, self-healing is a good way to do it. But if they need help and they want to reach out to a professional, they can do that as well. We have social-emotional libraries, which have lesson plans, reflection assignments. But we also have help services, which have hotlines around every type of problem that you can imagine where there are professionals there 24-7. We're always protecting the identity of the child. We never want to go across privacy, but we want them to have access, and we want to know where our problems are as leaders. We want to know, hey, we're having a lot of problems with 
harassment of this type or racism or fighting or whatever it happens to be so that we can know it's going on and we can start to address it as a community rather than pointing the finger at one person and saying it's you're the problem and having a punitive response which doesn't solve the long problem in the long term. It only delays the inevitable. And then finally, I'll show you, we have analytics in real time, because I did say I was on Wall Street for a lot of years, so I sat behind a Bloomberg machine watching risk and watching volatility. So we can now see, over any time period, what's going on, what's going right, what are all the positive things that are happening? All the giving and all the getting of positivity. But who's not participating is what we really want to know as leaders. Who's not getting, who's not giving? Those are the people those are the students that we want to support more and we want to figure out how to engage. Because those are the students that become the most disconnected. And it may be because of home life, it may be because of a problem in their social structure in school, whatever it is, we want to be able to identify them. But we also can see that from the problem side as well. Who's having the most problems and the most conflict, right? What restorative practices from the resource center are we using? Are they effective? Are we having the right conversation at the right time for the community because every community is different. And every community that we're in right now is different. Different leadership, different socioeconomics, different ethnicities, different overall sexual combinations and number of students and so on and so forth. So there is no one right answer. This is a set of tools and you'll figure out which of these tools you need to use in your communities. And now you at least have a toolbox to address these problems that are overwhelming everyone and our school leadership. And to think that they can handle it on their own is naive of us, and it's wrong. We need to support the leadership in schools. And how do we support them? We get behind what they're doing. We listen, we learn, just as our students are, because having the right conversation is what it's about. Yes? Tell them how emergent about so uh, a few months back, one of our seventh grade students, um, she had a good friend, uh, was starting to talk about suicide a lot. And then she started posting it up on Instagram. And she really started posting it up over the weekend on a Saturday. And so her friend saw all this, and she said she was going to commit suicide. So the student notified the school through, this, through our app, right, said, hey, and marked suicide and everything else. And the principal and the head counselor and the vice principal were all able to coordinate immediately, right? And they immediately contacted the student because it was filed confidentially, not anonymously, that there was a problem going on. And they could verify with the student who said, hey, my friend's really, really on the edge and she's gonna, says she's going to take her life this weekend. They were able to verify that and have that conversation confirm it. And when a principal talks to a student, that's important, right? You're, not, you're going to be engaged. It, it, that power is still there. That, that understanding and that respect is there. They then contacted the father of the daughter, and he said, thank goodness you called, because my daughter's locked in a room. We've been having trouble all weekend. And the principal said, get her on the phone. Tell her her principal's on the phone. And they were able to get her out of her room, get her on the phone with the principal. And the principal was able to talk her down and say, we're going to meet Monday morning in my office, and we're going to take this forward. The parents also found the pills which were out and open in the room. So whether or not she was going to take them, she was there. She was at that point. The amount of suicide ideation in the country is huge. The amount of attempted suicides is huge. They don't even have good numbers on it, but it's in the hundreds of thousands of students in a year. And we all keep it hush-hush, so we don't have great numbers on it but we know it's growing and we know it's getting worse. So to empower a student to make the call, that's what we want. And we want students to own it, right? Because it's their friends. If it wasn't her friend, would she have said anything? Probably not. Maybe. I mean, empathy is a hard thing. You have more empathy between friends than you don't, right? So today it's easy to walk by versus engage. But so these are the these are the questions we have to ask ourselves. Okay, so That's a lot. You said quite a bit. And I just want to make good on what I said earlier. 
What is the secret? You just look like you want to say it. <laughs> Anyone? Everyone. That's not an answer, that's a question. <laughs> so say it as a, as a response, as a question. We should say it as a yes. The secret changes from time to time. Based on what Jeff was saying, what's the secret? Pardon me? Empathy, yes. What else? Your purpose in life. To help others that are going around in the circle. Your purpose. Your purpose in life. Don't we all have to find that? To survive, not physically only, but emotionally, don't we all have to find that? And what happened in Jeff's life in terms of purpose, madam? as he explained it. He changed from being a worker in Wall Street to having a greater purpose in helping others find happiness and find their connection. Their connection, absolutely, absolutely. I would do this little poem basically with my seventh graders just to get them interested in poetry. But as I got older, I saw that these few lines talk so much about what we're meant to do and what we're meant to be. And of course, you're right, Nancy, it changes. The secret changes. It may sit in the middle, and it may not change in that way, but it's supposed to be a constant in our lives, something that we will do to make ourselves better people and to make others think about becoming better people. And so after 43 years of working with, with kids, students, I had to come out of retirement to work with someone who perhaps intuitively understood this poem, but definitely knew how to apply what he understood. Bridget has done so much so quickly, and it's really my honor to be the chief academic officer. And it is my honor because we literally saved a girl's life. And I don't know who can say that that doesn't have that kind of job, like a surgeon or uh, what do they call them? That speak with people who want to jump off buildings? There's a, a word for that, I should ask the police chief that. But there's a word for that, I can't think of it at this moment. But Bridget has done that very thing. And that's why we are so grateful that Nancy and some others asked us to come to talk about Bridget. Because all of us, from this day forward, have the ongoing pleasure, and sometimes it's a little tough, but the ongoing pleasure of finding out the secret. The secret is always with us, and we have to continue to find out for us what it is. And all of you who said love, that's part of it. Greater knowledge is part of it. Wisdom is part of it. But I just thank Jeff and the team with whom I work for making it much more palatable to understand. Everything that he showed you is in operation in schools in Brooklyn, New York, which is not the easiest place to be a teacher. I won't say anything about Florida except I love the climate. <laughs> but it's here in many schools, and the students and all of the um, faculties are enjoying it. 
And where's our other place? Uh, we're in California and LA. LA. We're expanding into 20 districts out there this year. Um, and we're, uh, we're in Queens and the Bronx and Staten Island. So, uh, and we're in Oregon as well. So we've been a small company building and working and working with teachers and students to, do you like it? Will you use it? Do you like the user interface? Does it make sense? And so it's about engagement. And engagement gets harder as they hit the teenage years when you're in high school, right? So that's why moving it over to the high schoolers' control in terms of driving it is where it needs to be. Because then it's theirs, it's not ours. And that's good. In the middle schools and the elementary schools, it's a more guided effort in terms of what we're doing. So, and it's all about listening. Listening to what their needs are. Listening to where their pain points are, right? And as parents, it's really hard to get their attention, uh, but you know, being connected is the best thing you can do to protect your children. And it is not easy, and we know it. We've raised children, we're raising children in this era, and we deal with all the challenges on a personal level that you deal with every day. So I, the last thing I'd like to say to close is thank you for listening. Thank you. We, we tell me is uh, actively engaged in working with the program. Tell me actually lives on Cuba Skin and uh, has been with the heat for a long time. Yes. You can't get one else to It turns out that Tony and Michael Gillespie. Uh, we haven't seen each other since high school. We were in the same If you inspire kids, they'll do it, right? Well, who inspires you today? Athletes and celebrities, right? So we've created Celebrity Pulse, and what we're going to do is work with some of the players and Tony to give shout-outs to an entire school and get a shout-out and have it only be positive and preset and have these same celebrities post in the news feed and inspire the kids to do good. And we can build competitions around that and so that it's now driven by the, those that they love to follow. Only it becomes a different relationship. It's not one of just following. It becomes one where we find the players and the, and the stars who really care and we give them a way to consistently participate uh, in the growth and social wellness of these students. And that's, so if we have students have to have a contest around positivity to participate when Glenn Rice or Taylor Swift comes to the school, guess what? They're going to participate, right? You're going to go, you're going to listen to them talk, you're going to hear what they say. They're going to put forward a challenge to you for the next four to six weeks, and you're going to help shape that challenge with them, and then they'll come back either virtually through the screens or otherwise and inspire that as it goes along. And you'll have that shout out. You'll have that memory of engagement that's more than just following them on Twitter or on Instagram. Uh, there'll be much more of a connection. And for the celebrities, it's a whole different level because if I'm a celebrity and I give a shout out to a whole school and I can see what percentage of boys and girls shouted back to me by grade on the first day versus the second, I'm going to know what my impact really is. Right? So now you're creating a relationship that's safe and positive and inspirational. And who wouldn't want that? So this is the beginning of several conversations. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you.